Okay, it's seven o'clock, so we'll get started. Um, welcome, everybody. This is great to have you all out here. We've got a good turnout. So uh, you'll notice name badges of some of the RMA members. So if you have any questions, want to learn more about the club, uh, we're available to help. Um, we want to thank Shills for the use of this facility. They've been very gracious uh, to let us use this and to, to sponsor the, the raffle. Uh, so that will be exciting. Um, so we have a lot to cover. So feel, feel free to uh, hold all your questions till the end of the event. We've got about five speakers. So um, one of the topics alone could fill about two hours. And the intent is kind of to cover the basics. So. Uh, we're going to hold the questions till the end to the end and then um, the, the store closes at nine uh, so we're going to press forward and but feel free to come talk to us um, uh, if you don't have enough time to get all your questions asked um, we also have a sign-up sheet and forest has the sign-up sheet in the back so if you'd like to sign up as an rma member or would like to learn more about the club he's got a uh, a list so we can give your contact information and then Michael Badger he will be also talking about some of what happens at our meetings uh, our monthly meetings uh, we really appreciate the time of all the speakers uh, we know that some of you've been working some uh, long hours and our first speaker dr. Robert Shields uh, is one of them he's been very busy and uh, we're so appreciative of his time. He didn't even have time to change coming from uh, his previous job. So, uh, Dr. Robert Shields, he's a leading biologist in the effort to improve the walleye spawning program. And he'll be speaking about uh, where the walleye are being stocked as well as the walleye program. So, Robert, I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you so much. Shields. I work for UDWR at the Fisheries Experiment Station in Logan, Utah. Um, I run the uh, aquatic research program for the division, for the aquatic section. Uh, basically, we serve as in-house consultants for the aquatic section. Um, we evaluate new methods and technologies. Um, we reply rapidly to any problems in the hatcheries or the wild fisheries uh, if they occur, and it's, and it's out of the purview of uh, the regional managers of biologists and uh, we implement full projects sometimes we just review literature and write uh, bullet point reports for the managers if they need some tips on how to handle the situation this is my team uh, Scott Adult and Jack Duddy uh, this is a, uh, overall a group of well-rounded uh, well-educated aquatic scientists uh, who cover basically the entire span of aquatic and fishery science. Uh, we're well prepared to handle just about anything that comes our way. Uh, I have plenty of walleye photos to that one just for this. Um, one of the things we've been tasked with is improving our warm water culture programs in Utah. Um, all of these programs are relatively new, you know, last 10, 12 years for the most part. Um, we work on hybrid striped bass, um, which uh, to, at this point has not been extremely successful in Utah. We import a lot of our wipers that we stock in the state. Um, the Tiger Muskie program uh, is a different story. That's something that's, that's been going very well the last few years. Uh, since 2019, we've been extremely successful. And of course, walleye. Uh, walleye program is something that got dropped on, uh, on my lap, on my working group last year. Um, after some very limited hatch rates uh, and I'll call it intermittent success uh, getting a decent group of walleye hatched, um, the director, the chief of staff uh, decided that this is now a research project and uh, so the research team is working on it. 
Uh, as of this week, actually, we spawned fish on Tuesday um, at Willard Bay. Actually, just two females out of the entire uh, catch uh, were ready to go. Today, we spawned 25. So the spawn is, is, is picked up, it's going full speed, and uh, we're going to be spawning two days a week for the next several weeks. Um, generally, a walleye spawn lasts about a week or two in many states. Uh, the reason for the extended length this year is to capture as much data as we can from the beginning to the end of the spawn uh, to really uh, zone in on, on the timing, the temperatures that triggered the spawn, and uh, how productive we can be before bycatch in the gill nets really uh, hampers the effort. So before I get into it too much, uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about walleye stocking in Utah. Um, this is the recent history of the walleye stocking. I didn't put numbers on this one. Um, you can look this up. If you get on Google and type in DWR fish stocking, there is a, a comprehensive list of what has been stocked. It's updated as the fish are stocked. Uh, it tells you where and how many. So anybody that's curious about more details, uh, feel free to get into it. Um, most of the uh, fish we stock are triploid fish. These are sterile fish. Um, we have mixed success uh, making sterile fish. At this point, it's a fairly new process for walleye. It's not as dialed in as we have it for trout. Um, so the ones that are 95% uh, or better sterility go in the upper Colorado River Basin. Uh, that's Big Sand Wash, Red Fleet, um, those reservoirs up there. Uh, if we have a less than optimal uh, induction uh, sterilization group, then they'll get put in other reservoirs, DMAP, Scofield, Gunnison, Yuba, which uh, my uh, U.S. Waters data set still calls uh, severe British Gulf War. Um, if you notice the, uh, the odd U sign, that's, that's an artifact of ArcGIS. That was a, a compass row, a really great one. Uh, but when you go between softwares, it, it turns it into something weird almost every time. Uh, we don't stock towel, but I'll fish ball like quite a bit down there. A lot of fun, uh, some controlling and bottom bouncing, so I thought I'd throw it in the map. So just for a more complete list of what we've got going on. So just to summarize the program, spawning at Utah began in 2015, at least on a, a production level. Um, as I mentioned, uh, success has been a bit sporadic. Uh, my team got involved in 2019, um, basically just to evaluate the rearing methods. Um, the triploid fish that we make, they're, they're some of the most valuable fish that, that we produce in Utah. A lot of time and money goes into it. And to optimize survival, we really um, would like to stock them out at a larger size. I don't know if, if y'all are aware of, of what size walleye usually get stocked out as, but they're about the size of an eyelash. You know, um, just about anything in the water can eat a lot of a walleye. They're barely even visible. Um, but raising them to larger sizes is problematic. Uh, so we have been adapting uh, methods from uh, Iowa and Kansas to try to make this uh, a more feasible situation. And some of these methods are, uh, I said there was a laser pointer up here somewhere, right? So if you notice the little box feeders, uh, that's a fairly uh, recent uh, design in, in fish feeding and aquaculture. Um, it's, a, it's set to disperse a, a micro feed and disperse it frequently. So as predators, even very small walleye will feed each other. They're very cannibalistic. You have to keep food in front of them all the time. That's why a feeder like this is important. And we've been working with these for a couple of years, uh, and they're being implemented in the hatcheries now. The other thing, if you look at the color of the water in these tanks, uh, it's actually got a clay slurry mixed into it. It uh, not only keeps the fish from eating each other, because they can't see as well, it also keeps them off the sides of the tanks and off the bottom of the tanks. Keeps them swimming in the middle for the most part. Um, 
and that way we avoid facial deformities and, and other problems that, that walleye can have. Uh, some of the other problems we have are uh, sticky eggs. Uh, walleye eggs are extremely sticky. There's several methods people use to de-stick them. But what happens in a hatching jar, as you can see in the bottom left picture, um, clumps of eggs collect gas bubbles from the inflowing water and it floats them to the top of the jar, pushes the lid off, and, and dumps them down, down the drain pretty much. So uh, evaluating several uh, different techniques that Some of the limitations we face that aren't faced in other states are we don't have pond facilities for grow out. The most common way to raise walleye is to fertilize a pond with alfalfa meal or some other kind of nutrient. Set off an algae bloom, that leads to a zooplankton bloom. Very small creatures in the water that the larval walleye will feed on for the first few weeks of life. We don't have that kind of, uh, that kind of facility, not very many of them anyway. We also have very limited success getting that algal zooplankton bloom uh, because of the climate uh, elevation in most places can be a bit prohibitive. Uh, and then uh, Utah aquaculture professionals are, are some of the best people I've ever worked with, but there are very few who have worked with warm water fish. It's a lot of trout culture. Uh, we have limited access to brood fish. We have two reservoirs that we can collect brood fish from. Most of them come from Willard, although we have branched out to starvation a couple of times with, with limited success. And then invasive species and pathogens keep us from moving water between hatcheries. Um, even using lake water to, uh, in the spawn process is, is unacceptable. Uh, we can move boiling disease, we can move other pathogens, and we can move uh, invasive species that way. So we actually bring a truck full of water from Manaway to Willard as we spawn, so we have a clean water source as we work. Uh, one of the steps we've taken to improve our success is interstate training. I took one of our hatchery uh, managers, Tyson Burrow, and we went to Rathburn Hatchery in Iowa just to learn more about how to, to raise and how to handle larval walleye. Like I said, they're, they're extremely tiny and they're difficult to work with when you're trying to raise them in a big tank. A tank that you have to siphon and clean every day without removing these minuscule fish. So our goal for the next couple years as a research project is refining uh, the process in Utah. The first thing we did was install a real-time data logger to track temperatures in Willard Bay. Uh, this is marina temperatures, which isn't exactly the same as the main part of the reservoir, but that is what we're calibrating our uh, spawn off of. If we use the same data every year, it's going to work out just fine. Um, we've had this in the water since last fall. That way we can quantify how many degree days, how much temperature per day in an additive way uh, leads up to the spawn. A lot of uh, animals, especially fish, um, their life cycle is dependent on, on a cumulative amount of temperature, not necessarily the temperature hit 43 degrees, it's time to go. No, it's, it's how many degrees have they gotten this year, and that's what we're shooting for. Um, egg adhesion, like I said earlier, we use tannic acid um, for our triploid lots, because we put them in a pressure chamber, we don't <coughs> have time to add clay to them. Fuller's Earth is the clay product we use after fertilizing the eggs, they become sticky almost immediately and will dump uh, uh, a clay solution into the pan and mix it in for about 90 seconds and then rinse it. It's time consuming and for the triploids we only have seven minutes between fertilization before we have to get them in a pressure chamber. Uh, so we're working on a way to, to make that work, but so far we haven't tried that yet. Uh, the new one we're trying this year is pineapple juice. Uh, it has a, a protease enzyme uh, that actually breaks down the protein that causes the eggs to stick. Uh, I'm not a fan. We've done uh, several lots already this year and, and they're still pretty sticky. Uh, the good news is that our uh, full reserve lots that we spawned today uh, don't seem to be sticking even one bit. So hopefully we'll be able to adapt that to both the diploid and the triploid lots in the future. The other thing is to look at previous data. Um, so one of the things I'm really focused on, on is this, this top left graph, females used. There's no logical reason that using more females in a lot of fish 
would cause a decline in hatch rate unless you realize that last year the goal was to put two liters of eggs in every single lot. So if you have more females, what that means is you're using much smaller fish to fill that two liter lot. We're not constraining it this year to any uh, specific uh, size of lot. Um, we're more focused on using larger females and bidding them up in a way that we can tell a difference. So uh, each lot will be called a, a large, medium, or small lot based on the size of the females, not the size of the lot of eggs. And when we're done, we'll be able to look at that data and say, well, it's not worth it to spawn a fish that's less than 20 inches. We'll spawn fish that are only 22 or higher. That should increase our survival from egg to hatch and our efficiency and the number of fish we can stock. Uh, one of the other things we did for experiments is uh, come up with these 500 milliliter McDonald's style hatching jars. I had a glass blower at Utah State make a bunch of these for me. Um, just so we, when we have the opportunity to make small lots for comparison, we can get replicates, which is necessary for statistical analysis. And uh, they really work fantastic. You can see how the eggs are rolling on this one here. <coughs> feel like skip something, but I didn't. So I'm just going to wrap up with a few photos from this year's spawn. We're getting a lot of bigger fish than we've seen previously. Um, we have been very successful at uh, spawning multiple lots, and some lots are looking just excellent. So uh, that's all I have tonight. If there's any questions, I guess we're going to do them later. Uh, my time is up, so I'm going to turn over the mic. Thank you, Dr. Shills. Uh, one of the opportunities that we have when we come to RMA meetings is we get to listen to a lot of the biologists from the DNR, fish coordinators, our fellow uh, member Lee Rasmus, and does a great job of lining up our speakers. Um, speaking of speakers, our next speaker is Jay Kammer. Um, Jay Kammer is a pro fisherman and he is going to uh, talk to us about the electronics to find walleye. Um, I want to make a special note that Jake has a charter guide service called the Walleye Pursuit. And if you're interested, you can talk, uh, reach him at walleye.pursuit.utoutlook.com. So walleye.pursuit ut at outlook.com. Is it working? No. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, like you said, so moved to Utah about six years ago. I grew up in the Midwest. Um, started fishing tournaments when I was, God, my family probably 10 years old. Uh, moved out west and really didn't find initially as many walleyes as I'd hoped to. Um, so I've kind of ground my way around out here and found that this is actually one of the best walleye fisheries in the entire country if you grind for it and you travel a little bit. So I've probably caught more 10 pound walleyes out of Utah and the surrounding states than most people do in the Midwest. A lot of people think that uh, there's a 30 inch goal or a 10 pound goal on walleyes and, and if you put in the hard work out here, you guys definitely have some of the best walleye fishery, fisheries in Utah and surrounding areas. Um, like was mentioned before, I started a guide service last year and that was partially I ended up with a little bit of free time, and I really enjoyed teaching people how to catch more walleyes. And uh, I think the last time I came to one of these meetings was uh, 2015 or 2016, and there definitely wasn't this many people at the one I went to. So it's pretty cool to see this many people interested in walleye fishing in Utah because we're kind of the outcasts here, the oddballs, the guys like to chase walleyes or are really infatuated with catching walleyes. We're a little bit different. And you'll find that most walleye guys are really secretive. They're probably not going to tell you the best way they caught them or where they caught them or when they caught them. And if they do tell you, it's probably not exactly the truth. So, <laughs> now, if you come on, on a guide trip with me to Willard, I'll give it all of you. That place, to me, it's where I love teaching people how to catch walleyes because it is so freaking good for two to three months. That place is just phenomenal. It's one of the better fisheries we have in the state. I think second to it numbers-wise is going to be Powell. But, I mean, Willard, when it's on and you're getting in the right size class, I mean, you can catch a pile of 18 to 22-inch fish out of there, and it's, it's a lot of fun. So... Um, this presentation we do here, this is a very small snippet of trying to talk about this and have it make sense but not go over my time limit. So I'll do what I can. 
Um, kind of just start off with these are the three freshwater most common electronics guys that are using Garmin, Humbird, and Lance. Now, each one has their own niche, and, and guys that spend a lot of time with electronics are going to say, you know, it's kind of like Ford, Chevy, GM, whatever it is. Um, you're going to have one person that really has a hard on for this one or that one. Me personally, I think every single one of these brands has something they're really dang good at. So uh, we start over with Hummingbird. Hummingbird, hands down, has the best side imaging in the industry. Mega side imaging, there's nothing that can touch it. There's some brands that are getting close. Um, my Lowrance lies, I'm a, I'm a Lowrance guy for the most part. Um, they're getting really close. I mean, uh, I'll show you some in images here in a minute, and my lives look just about as good. Um, now, Lowrance claim to fame is their 2D. Um, so when I travel to the Great Lakes or places like that, I, I, I have my boat set up where I can graft fish at 40 miles an hour, and I'm doing high-speed grafting across the Great Lakes, because these schools um, will move so much that we have to cover a lot of water to find them. Um, and not only that, just the pictures. So like, um, when I fish with my buddies for lake trout out here, my Lowrances are typically better for vertical fishing lake trout. I have better images. Um, now, Garmin's claim to fame, obviously, over the last couple of years is they're live. I have not ran Hummingbirds live yet, but I can tell you that the Lowrance isn't far behind. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the live as we go a little bit further in. <clears throat> so we're talking about 2D. So what's kind of cool about fishing Willard, especially in the summer, you're going to start marking your walleyes like this. They're going to be suspended. It makes it really easy to find the fish on 2D. Um, the reason that the walleye suspend in Willard is as the water warms up, the shad start to move higher in the water column, chasing um, various whatever things they're, they're chasing food-wise. And then secondly, they're chasing the light. So if you ever notice at Willard, you'll see balls of shad kind of towards the bottom in the morning. And then as you work in the afternoon, the evenings, they're up super high. Sometimes I'm out there trolling. I don't tell many people this. Sometimes I'm trolling baits five to 10 feet behind those boards. Uh, a lot of people in Utah have this concept, or concept in their head that we need to be running baits all the way at the bottom. Not at Willard, because those fish are moving up, chasing shad in the evenings, and a lot of times I'm catching fish right below the surface. Um, so this is a great representation here. So that middle uh, middle mark there, that's a suspended, we'll just say that's walleye. I don't know what this is, but we'll say that's a suspended walleye there. And most of, most of our lakes, what you're going to be seeing is that bottom in, image when you're using 2D. So you'll go over the top. If you're not really familiar, you don't have your setting set right, you don't know if that was a rock or a fish. Now that's where we go into our settings. Once you get your palette set up on your graphs and you're completely used to them or confident in them, say your vertical jig and you see that mark on the bottom, like, okay, I, that palette looks like a fish to me just because of the color on the return. You got your color set up right. I mean, until you're getting a hard return off that fish, um, drop a jig on it, you see it move, you catch a fish, then you feel confident on that color palette you have. If you're not comfortable with it or you haven't learned your graphs enough and you see that thing on the bottom, you might go, oh, we just went over a rock, right? Um, so it's kind of getting your palette set up and learning how to read your graphs. Um, now, 2D for me, really about the only time I'm using 2D for the most part is structure. Um, you know, if I'm looking at a point or something like that, I might graph over it a couple times, or high speed graphing fish. 2D for me is kind of not something I use a lot. You get in my boat, I might not even have 2D up. I might be just running a mapping and side imaging <clears throat> or live. I, I don't use 2D a whole lot. Um, kind of talk about the high speed graphing. Um, some great places for high speed graphing is maybe a new body water. Say you're going to power right now and the water's super low. Um, you get your transducer set right and you can graph at 40 miles an hour. Um, you can tell when the bottom's moving under, right? We're, we're finding new structures that people don't know about in POW currently. So um, if you get your transducer set right, I run fiberglass boats. So one thing that I do is I run a through hole transducer. So that's actually internal on the boat and it's epoxied in. Um, and I can, my last boat, my last Vexus, I could read bottom at 46 to 48 miles an hour lose it around 50. So that gives you a lot of opportunity, one, for safety. When you're flying across a lake you don't know, you know where the bottom is, and then I could graph fish at 30 miles an hour. You know, in Willard, um, when I'm out there guiding, I'm looking for a guide trip, I can graph those fish at 30 miles an hour as I'm running across the lake. So when you get the, your 2D figured out, those are a couple benefits to that. Um, transducer alignment. This is, I don't have time to go in depth on this, but if you are not getting good images out of your 2D, um, Get on YouTube and start looking at transducer alignments. There's different things where you can do where you sit where your, uh, see where your boat sits in the water and where your transducer is. So um, like my Vexus, it sits like this in the water. So you have to imagine how that transducer is going to sit and you have to get that angle right. Now there's some videos on YouTube that can help you get your angles like right on your 2D so you're getting the right picket picture. You're not shooting this way and you're not shooting behind the boat. You want that perfectly level as can be. So um, if that's an issue you think you're having, jump on YouTube and check that out. <clears throat> I kind of discussed the bottom verse uh, suspended. Now something else of note. So most of these fish finders you're looking at, you're gonna have like a, uh, what do we have? Like a 60, 60 uh, kilohertz uh, frequency, a 200 frequency, and then you're gonna have chirp, medium chirp, high chirp. 
So what that is doing, these different frequencies, that's how wide your cone is down there. So if we're looking at a 200, that's a really tight cone. So if we're fishing lakers, really deep water, we're probably gonna be on 200 if you're not running chirp units. So we'll just add that in a minute. Um, if you're running shallower water, you're probably gonna want a wide, wider cone angle. Or if you say you're chasing perch, you wanna be able to see the school and you're only in 10, 12 foot of water, you wanna see wider below the boat, you're gonna run a different frequency. Now, the best frequency in my opinion is definitely the chirp units. So the chirp uses multiple frequencies to come up with one picture, where instead of just running 200 or just running 60, now you're using multiple frequencies at the same time. That's why a lot of times you have a clearer picture when you're running chirp. Hopefully I'm not saying too much and it's just going straight over everyone's heads depending on what graphs they're using, but um, that's just kind of a little bit about frequency. Like I said, I could do hours on this presentation. So Now we're looking at down imaging. There's only about two places that I use down imaging. One is bodies of water with trees or if I'm going over a bunch of rock. So in a tree, you'll come over a mess, we'll say the middle. Um, these aren't really great images, but sometimes, you know, um, I, I fished Lake McConaughey quite a bit in Nebraska. Um, there's sunken trees out there. You come over a tree, you go, okay, it was a tree. Was there any fish in it? But if you have sun imaging or have down imaging on, you come over and you'll start seeing arches in the trees. Um, on McConaughey, that knows, uh, then we know we're gonna start pulling spinnerbaits through the trees. We actually use bass spinnerbaits and trauma web core through the trees. Um, so it's different things like that can help you identify. If you're chasing crappie, uh, the first image in the middle there, you would not see the crappie in there. But if you run it down the gene, now you can actually see those fish suspended in the trees. So a little bit of something to help you figure out. Me personally, that is about the only time I use down the gene. Beyond that, like I said, rock. So when you come over rock and there's fish on them, you already get a really hard return off those rock piles. Um, so if you go into down imaging, you'll start seeing the arches of the fish. You'll see that color variation. So um, that's where down imaging comes to play for me. <clears throat> now, side imaging, I mentioned a little bit ago, um, the claim to fame for, I don't really know how to use this, we'll just use that. Claim to fame for Humminbird is definitely their side imaging, um, the Mega. On the left over there, that is actually in my boat. Those are all walleye scattered across the bottom with my live units. So as you can see, I can get perfectly good pictures out of Lawrence's uh, side imaging. Um, and I mean, Hummingbird's great. If I had to say a big complaint about my Lowrance to running Hummingbird's SI, Lowrance, I can't change the chart speed. So what happens with the chart speed is the boat's going faster, it doesn't match the speed of the boat. Um, so you end up with really elongated images or super small images. But if you can change the chart speed, which you can on a Hummingbird and a Garmin, the images are going to come out looking like normal sized fish instead of super long if you're going slow or super tiny if you're going fast. That's something I can't do with my Lowrance for whatever reason. Um, now where this comes into play, let's say we're out at starvation and you're up on the uh, north end and you're going uh, going across you know kind of by the weed beds and there's a bunch of uh, what is there? there's humps up there flats and this is where this comes into play i'll come across the flat i'll see if i saw what i see on the left side there all those fish watered up i'd drop a couple waypoints i'd turn around and i'd start fishing so you can just cover a way wider um, distance of water so if we're running 2d we might be looking 10 feet below the boat well on that image there what am i where i have mine set at I'm looking at 120 wide. Um, and I pretty much, in my other answers, I can probably look 80 to 100 wide pretty confidently if I'm sub 20 foot of water. So I can be looking, and that's on each side. So I can be looking at 200 foot wide when I'm covering an area looking for fish. So it just um, gives you a lot more opportunity to find fish and narrow down where they're at uh, using side imaging. And obviously you can use it for structure too. Um, rock on side imaging gets a little funky. You can definitely still read rock, but it's not as good as trees or hard bottom, you know, big flats. Flats definitely, definitely are, are where they're killer. So now going into live. So I've been running live, I'm not sure, I think it's my third or fourth season going into live. Um, for the guys that like to cast a lot or vertical fish, live is absolutely incredible. It's one of the funnest things you can do. Um, there's guys out there that hate it, say, oh, you're cheating or um, saying that, you know, that's not really fishing, you're playing a game, it's just a video game. But I'll tell you what, there's certain places where this thing, I mean, you catch fish that you never manage. I was fishing in Hawaii last year, a National Walleye Tour event there. Um, I feel like I should have won the event, I made some bad decisions. Uh, the guy was leading day one, John Hoyer was doing the exact same thing I was. Um, one of my buddies took uh, eight, and then I think he was doing the same thing I was, I made bad decisions. But where I'm going with this is the live, uh, the fish that I found were in 60, well, 60 foot of water, and I was catching walleyes 20 foot below the surface with jigging wraps. So I was in 60 foot of water, I'd pan, oh, there's one 20 foot down, pitch to it. And I'd watch the jig drop live, snap it in their face and catch them. We were catching six, eight, nine pounders doing that. So those fish, if you're running traditional 2D, sign imaging, all that stuff, never would have happened. You'd never know they're there ever if you didn't have live where you can pan and look at them. 
Now, something I'm gonna crack the code on this year 100% is doing that on Willard. I am 100% confident that I can do the exact same thing on Willard with live with those suspended fish, the way they suspend so hard. Um, after figuring kind of what I could do in previous years at other bodies of water, we went to leach one year, it was the same scenario, except with jig and a minnow, 50 foot of water right below the surface, you'd never know they're there. Um, now, you can look at structure with them, that's a big deal I'll use them for, so um, when I won the Starvation Classic a couple years ago, what I was doing is I was running down a point and I would pan off to the left as we're pitching and my buddy's in the back and I'd say, hey, there's a fish 60 foot out, pitch up to it. Well, the biggest fish we got in the tournament, I think it was seven and a half, and I actually called that fish before we caught it. It was like 50 foot away from the boat, saw a big mark up there. I said, hey, watch where I pitch and follow me. So I pitched a jig and a crawler up, I walked it over its head, set it right in its face, didn't move. He came up behind me with another bait, snapped it over its head, I watched the fish dart across the bottom, I said, you ready, it's gonna hit it. Snap your rod, and he snapped it. I watched a seven and a half pounder come up and eat his bait from 50, 50, 55 feet away from the boat. So it opens you up to opportunities of things you never see. Uh, the next big fish we got the following day, day two of the tournament, I caught that fish in three foot of water, 50 foot away from the boat at noon. It was, I don't know, 70, 80 degrees, bluebird skies. Fish never should have been there for anything that's a traditional walleye fisherman. That fish should not have been two, three foot of water, but I saw him up there, pitched a jig up at him and got him. And it was, I think, five and a half, maybe just under six pounds. So um, it just teaches you to catch fish that you don't normally know are there. Um, sometimes I'll pull up to a point, I'll blind cast it, cast out of a place like you would normally on a point, I won't catch a fish. I'll turn around and look at it live. I'll find a pocket of fish under a boulder or by this spot and we'll sit there and pick them apart because we can see them. Other times it'll hurt you because you can see fish, um, you can't get them to bite. So you can find a school of fish, you're looking at them swimming around right in front of you, you pitch and you pitch and you pitch and they won't touch it. Um, I also use it trolling on, uh, on Willer. So what I'm talking about initially was the forward view. So that's the one on the far left. Uh, this right here, this is scout view, perspective view, depending on what brand you're using. On uh, Willard, I'll actually use that and I'll be looking in front of the boat and I'll see a school of walleye because I can look, you know, I'll get it set 80, 100 foot wide as I'm trolling and I'll see a school of walleye out there and I'll turn actually the entire boat into boards and I'll come over the top of the schools. Um, so that's a really, a really unique thing about that that works well too. Down imaging, I don't use much other than ice fishing. I don't fish vertical below the boat very often, so uh, ice fishing, absolute riot. Learned a lot about fish this year doing that. Um, something I just thought about that I want to go back to talking about Willard. <clears throat> So on the side imaging, something else you can do with this. So you can see all these fish. You see where these shadows are below these fish? They're really tight to the fish. Now when you're at Willard, and I did a, a show that in Meeple last year, and I talked about this, and I think some people got it, some people didn't make a lot of phone calls, like what the heck were you talking about? So you can see on the side imaging there where I can see those fish, and you see the shadows are really tight to the fish. Now on Willard, when those fish get up high in the water and you're using side imaging, you'll notice, so all these grass salt marks down here, right? So we got 20, 40. A lot of times I'll mark a fish right here and his shadow will be 10 feet away. So that gives you an idea that fish is 10 foot suspended right now. So if you start seeing shadows where you're side imaging, and we have a mark here and the shadow is up tight to it, that guy's down in the dirt, he's in the bottom. But you see that shadow 10 feet away, you know your fish are starting to lift off the bottom. <clears throat> when those fish start to get super high in the water, a lot of times I don't mark them on 2D, I only see them on side imaging. So if you're just running 2D on Willard and you're cruising around looking for fish, don't see me, and you're on the troll, these fish are moving so high in the water column that you're coming over the top of the boat, you won't see them on 2D, you only see them on the side of the jig. So, something I want to go back to that I kind of forgot to mention. I don't know where I'm at on time, but uh, I went through that as fast as I could with as much information as I could. So, is there any questions? I'm probably going to be out of here before this is over. So, uh, any questions for anybody? What do you got? When you do your, your imaging, or your, uh, your live imaging, are you uh -huh. putting your transducer on your trolling motor okay. or separate pole? So this is the great debate of live right here. Everyone wants to argue about it, make their own decision. Uh, first two years I ran out of pole, so I ran the Garmin live scope first, and then I switched to Active Target after that, which is Lorenz version. There is no perfect win to this, right? So if you like to fish structure, you like to cast points, say you're going to starvation, that's what I do at starvation, I cast points all day long, don't stop. On the trolling motor is the best way to do it, hands down, until the wind comes up. The front of the boat starts to hop so hard that you can't see anymore. And the boat control, I run, um, the best way to do it is on a cable steer trolling motor um, because the way that the cord wraps around it, um, if you think about a trova, there's a sleeve and your, the rod runs through the sleeve, right, to, to, to uh, stow it, there's nowhere for your cable to go. Now, if you're running the Ultrex, which is a cable steer unit, there's no, no sleeve for it to go through. It's just you have it mounted directly to a pole. 
So that's why the old Trex is better, and then you have better foot control with the cable steer. So I run mine on a cable steer for that reason. Now, where it doesn't work as well is when you get a big wind and you're in the front of the boat and it's hopping, you can't see anything because that transducer is basically coming out of the water, and then you lose your boat control because you can't hit spot lock because you can't see anything once it spot locks, right? It's just going to face the wind with that, uh, with that transducer on it. Away from windy days and river fishing, it is the only way to go is on a trolling motor. And the reason is, what I do is I stand in the front of the boat, I have one foot on the pedal, and I'll find a fish, I'll pan over to the fish, I turn, I pitch, I watch the bait fall, maybe the boat adjusted. Now I adjust with the pedal and I stay back on that fish. Now if you're doing a pull and you're trying to do the same thing, you're here doing this. You'll find a fish, you're here on the pole, and you're pitching and you're trying to adjust the pole to stay on the fish. It, it doesn't work. I don't care how hard you try, I did it for a year. Now where the pole comes in handy, um, say you're working a shoreline, you can adjust that pole like a 45 in front of you, and now you have the drone motor set at a half mile an hour, and you just have that pole set and you're scanning. And then when you see a fish, you stop, and then you pitch to it. Once again, you're back to that pole, trying to adjust the pole, trying to stay on the bait. If you don't care to see your bait, you just want to know there's a fish there, the pole is the way to go. I actively chase them with the bait. I'll see the bait land, and I have it walk right in front of their face. So for me, there's really no other way than on the trolling motor. But what I started doing this year is I'll be running one in the rear on a pole. So on the windy days where it gets to be too rough, it's too crazy, you can't be in the front of the boat where I have to spot lock, I'll be in the back of the boat with the pole making it work but it's pretty tough to do with a pool. So, anyone else got any questions? All right, guys. Thanks, sir. Thanks so much, Jake. Uh, I understand you have a tournament tomorrow, so we appreciate you taking the time to come down here, and best of luck. Uh, I'm going to have Janine uh, write uh, the email address for, for those of you that would, would like it. Um, okay, uh, our next speaker is our president, uh, David Hansen, and he will be speaking about bottom bouncing. My second time fishing was with David Han uh, Hansen, and it was a blast, so we look forward to your presentation. Oh, also, for those of you that um, are taking notes, we are recording this on YouTube, and so our tech guru, Badger, will have this on video for you. Yeah, great. I noticed a few people taking pictures of the slides and stuff. It should be captured on paper. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm David Hanson. I uh, started going to RMA uh, a dozen years ago. Um, I'm talking about bottom bouncing. It's really high level. I'm assuming that you may not have may not know what bottom bouncing is. So just in case, the reason why we use bottom bouncing so much is it works. It's a really easy uh, trolling technique. Um, you want to be moving slowly forward and being able to control your speed, usually trying to keep um, uh, to within 3.4 miles an hour to 1.4 miles an hour or so. For that reason, um, a trolling motor is uh, it's very highly recommended. Now, if you can see here, the angle of the line there going in is about right. So you got your main line that leads down to a bottom bouncer, which is a, a, a heavier weight, uh, usually on a wire. We got a couple of examples. And then all sorts of things you control behind it. Usually we're pulling worm harnesses. Um, so again, I'm going to try to move quickly, and if, if uh, you've got questions afterwards, I, I have one of my rigs here. I've got a bunch of uh, examples of the worm harnesses I use. Please come on up, and we'll, we'll be up here right after the meeting, and we can talk about some of it. You're also welcome to come to, some of, uh, to an RMA meeting, which is a, they're always the second Tuesday of every month, 7 p.m., here in this room. Um, why we bottom bounce is you cover a lot of territory, and it works. If you're a, a novice walleye fisherman, it's one of the easiest ways to get into it. It's not only a method of covering water and finding them, again, use your electronics uh, as, as much as you can, but you can uh, keep the, your, your bait slightly elevated off the bottom. You do want to be near the bottom. Uh, <laughs> and you don't want to put out too much line. You want to be able to have a heavy enough line to get down, a uh, heavy enough weight to get down, uh, and you want it near the bottom because that's where the walleye are hanging out, for the most part. Uh, it helps you avoid snags. You can then also, if you've got a couple of uh, poles that you're using, you can put one in, the, uh, in a rod holder 
and actively fish another. Uh, you can actually bottom mount from, uh, from the front of the boat and the back of the boat for your friends. The only secret there is make sure that the back of the boat is the same weight or lighter than the front of the boat. Otherwise, the front of the boat's going to reach back and snag them. If everybody's using two ounce or everybody's using three ounce weights, you're not gonna you're not gonna snag each other up very much. Unless you do like a friend of ours who thought that you put out 150 feet of line um, in a 40 foot depth, and then we snagged all over the place. Um, it allows a variety of lures. You can pull not just worm harnesses behind this, but swim baits, crank baits, um, and just plain bait if you want to just have a, a baited hook. But for the most part, um, you're going to be using, I mean, I usually use worm harnesses when I'm bottom bouncing. The fact that you're fishing deep below the boat, I mean, I mean you know, deep is relative, of course, in a lot of the lakes, we're, we're talking uh, 20 feet, Willard Bay. But you can make quick turns. If everybody's got bottom bouncers down, um, you, can, you can make fairly tight turns, S turns, once you find the fish, you can turn about and come back through them. Once you catch one, you know that there's more there. Um, it's not that they particularly school, but they do hang out in the same areas. Okay, so the elements would be uh, an electronic trolling motor. It's technically possible to bottom bounce with a standard uh, gas motor, but the guys, whoever's doing that is gonna be driving, you know, the driver is gonna be spending his entire time trying to control speed and, and motion. Um, if, if you uh, don't have a trolling motor, it makes it a little bit tougher. For the rod and reel, you don't have to spend a lot of money. This is one of my rigs here. It's, uh, I, I like using a bait cast that leads down to the bottom bouncer. And I can show you a little bit more about this afterwards as well. But inexpensive is okay. I particularly like, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a bait cast reel. I like the bait cast so you can just hit a button and release down. Control your descent as you're going down because if you got a heavy weight and, and you just let it free fall, your worm harness is probably going to wrap up around the line as it falls. So slow me down. Control it with your thumb. Let the weight down slowly until you feel the bottom. Then come up a couple of cranks. And at that point, you're good to go, especially on flat lake features like at Willard or the Charleston Flats of Deer Creek or the, the northern part of starvation out on the flats out there. Um, as a general rule, an ounce bottom bouncer for around 10 foot depths, ounce and a half for a little bit deeper, two ounce uh, for 26 to 35, and three ounce for above. Um, I often just use a three ounce because I'm at the front of my boat and that way I know that everybody behind me is gonna be less or equal to that so that my line will go down to the bottom at a steeper angle than theirs, and I know that I'm not going to trail back into them and, and, and hook up. What speed is the taller um, Basic, oh, you know, still about the same speed. Um, point, point 0.4 to 1.4, for the most part. Uh, I, again, what I like for the main line that leads down to the bottom bouncer, itself, uh, I, I prefer braid, it's good and strong. If you tie your own worm harnesses, which starts to get addictive, um, to find that you're catching fish and it's something you made, uh, there, you, there are so many varieties of spoon, uh, of, of blades, of beads, uh, and, and actually there's a couple of things that, uh, that I'm hoping even if you're familiar with, maybe you haven't tried, because there's, there's some new types of uh, blades that are out now. So, the, you know, if the leader though, if you do tie your own, um, use, a, use a heavy line. Um, use a 15 to 20 pound leader to hook or to tie up your worm harnesses. The reason being is you want the rigidity in the line so that the blade can turn. If you use six or eight pound test, It'll look great, the fish won't be able to see it, but the blade itself, as it, as it moves, uh, doesn't spin as well on the, the thin line like that. Uh, a sturdier line helps the blade spin. 
Once you drop it into the water, you can watch it as well. So before I drop to the bottom, if, if I want to make sure that I'm getting a good enough spin out of the blade I'm using, um, I'll just put it alongside the boat where I can see it before I let it drop to the bottom. There are different types of blades. Let's first all talk about the bottom bouncer types. What I've got rigged up here is what's there on the right. I like that setup. because the line comes down from the pole through here to a swivel and on that swivel is where you're going to tie the worm harness. But I can put a pencil weight onto that. The thing I like about that is when a fish hits it, it sl the line slides through. So the fish isn't feeling the full weight of that three ounces hooked to the worm. Uh, it'll slide. You'll still feel some resistance, but you won't feel the, he won't feel the, the full three ounces. So this is the most common kind that we find just about everywhere. It works great. I still use them all the time, even though I prefer this one. And there's a whole bunch of varieties of, of all different shapes and sizes and types of bottom bouncing weights. Again, I usually, you know, 90% of everything I use is either a two ounce or a three ounce. The lures pulled behind them would be spinner rigs, worm harnesses, where there's a blade, a bead, and some hooks. Um, you can do crank baits and swim baits or a bear hook and bait. And I'm trying to get through this quickly, but here is what's typical, is a Colorado blade. Um, this shows a metal clevis on this. Now you want a clevis, you don't want the line to go straight through the blade because as that spins, um, it'll eventually abrade the line and, and cause the line to fail at the worst possible time. Uh, when I make my own, I use a classic quick change clevis. In fact, sometimes if I bought an, or if I purchased a, uh, a worm harness just like this, I'll take that blade and clevis off the line and put a quick change on because that allows you to switch blades. Um, there, there have been times where a Raider Colorado blade of various colors isn't doing it, but a Colorado blade that has a hole through it gives a different vibration as it spins and that would turn it turn the secret and be the, you know, the, the trick for the day. This is what's referred to as a smile blade made by Max Lures. And this is an example of one that uh, has been killing them lately on Deer Creek. This is a uh, slow death hook. So you put the worm up onto that, up where the line attaches to your swivel. Uh, make sure you've got good barrel swivels because this whole thing the, the, the hook and the line is going to slowly rotate. So you want to make sure you're not getting any line twist. So you can put bead swivels or a good barrel swivel up at the top. Make sure that that's not going to be a problem. But again, this is referred to as a smile blade. There are also winged blades, butterfly blades, which is like a solid polycarbonate, uh, prop blades, which I don't use much, and this is one I'm excited about. It's called a Montana blade. I haven't fished it yet. It, uh, it wasn't out last fall. It's new now. I've got an example here, but you can see what it is. is a very thin layer of mylar, and it's going to spin as you travel through the water. And the nice thing about it is it's reversible. Um, so the fish coming from the side, like right now on this, would see the color, but a fish coming from you know, directly behind wouldn't see the color. So you can reverse it and the fish coming from behind would see it. Okay, so just a couple of hints. Control the speed of your initial drop. Don't let, just, don't just let it fall. Uh, adjust the depth of your line as, as you need. You want to be near the bottom. Um, Try to, as your line goes into the water, try to maintain a 45 degree angle or less or steeper. Uh, you don't want it to go too far back. Uh, if, you, if you are going too far back, especially with a lot of line, there's an increased chance that your hook is going to you know, get snagged up. If fishing from the front, the, the front and the back, put the heavier bottom bouncer weights up front. Uh, Swap out weights as needed to get where you need to be. S turns, once you find the fish, are effective. Walleyes at times will hook themselves on these. So if you've got a dead, a dead pole, I mean a pole and a pole holder, sometimes they'll hook themselves. More often, you'll see the resistance change and you're gonna to wanna to sweep that forward 
not a not a not a trout to set the hook or a bass yeah yank the hook but a, but a sweep forward to try to set the hook for them. Um, while I, if you haven't caught them before this way, they feel like a heavy pressure. You'll think that you may be pulling up a chunk of wood. They don't fight much. They eat great. Um, once they get to the boat, they, th they start to get a little more aggressive when you're fighting. Um, take the time to search for fish before you drop lines. Uh, as, as Jake talked about, uh, scanning and trying to find likely spots, you're going to look for uh, places where fish are holding, off of points, near weed beds. Um, and once you catch a walleye, go back through that spot again. If you have a trolling motor that allows you to record the track, use it. That uh, is, is, is really great. I can't tell you how many times we've been on PAL. Catch one fish, I've been recording the track, so I can turn the boat around and say, replay that. Now I'm, I'm not driving, I'm just fishing, and we're going to go back and forth through the same spot exactly and it's been surprising how many times we hit a certain spot where the, the, you know, the fish have schooled up and we'll start pulling them up. Once you find that, and if you're having as much fun as we usually do, we don't usually swap, but if you do swap, you can stop right over the top of them and start vertical jigging uh, once you know that you're on a school. Um, and check the stomach contents of the first walleye or two that you catch. We've been on Willard where we find that the walleye are eating small black bugs. And at times, black beads and little teeny black blades, after we knew what, we know what the walleye tend to be snapping at, uh, had been a, you know, very effective. And I think that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, President. Uh, all right, our next speaker is Benjamin Allen. Uh, Benjamin Allen uh, served as a tournament director formerly with the uh, Rocky Mountain Anglers. Um, for those of the, you that don't know, he and his partner, Greg Moore, and won the Starvation Classic um, uh, last year. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. And, uh, uh, and thanks to Ben, he's given quite a few uh, presentations this year and helped out and he's always willing to share and he's very humble about his skills. So with no further ado, Ben Allen, I'll give you the floor. Thanks for the introduction. I don't know if I'm going to hold this or not. But uh, my, how things have changed. Five years ago I was in Cabela's talking to the guy selling fish finders and he's like, you'll never use down imaging, you'll never use side imaging. I've never fished a day without either of those, so especially side imaging. Just to kind of echo what Jake talked about, it's your only way to look under the water. And it's, uh, it's like having the internet nowadays. I mean, if you were trying to buy a car years ago, you'd drop by different dealerships trying to find the one you want. Now you just look them up online, it saves you a ton of time. Side imaging saves you so much time. Um, Mega live kind of stuff, live imaging, Pretty advanced, I just barely bought a system trying to learn it. But anyways, um, get to know your system. That's your only way of looking under the water. Just that's all I'm gonna say about that. Um, and I don't know what kind of fish Dave's catching because the walleyes I catch fight pretty hard. So um, I'm, I mean with a bottom bouncer, it's your technique. Um, trolling and you got that heavy weight, maybe that could affect the way the fish fight. But my favorite way of uh, fishing is what I'm gonna be talking about tonight. Uh, jigging, and uh, specifically jigging for Utah walleyes. Um, obviously people throw jigs for bass, and you can throw for trout, you throw for every multi-species there is. Um, what is jigging? It's a technique. It's a tool. Uh, they just talked about bottom bouncing. It's a technique. That one's trolling, you're moving. Um, jigging, you're moving the, uh, the lure yourself with the pole. Um, and it's basically repetitive up and down movements. That's a jig. Um, and it's the most versatile technique there is uh, because you can fish anywhere, any depth of the water column, any bait, a combination of baits. Um, you can combine it with different techniques, trolling, drifting. Um, it's, it's unmatched. Uh, if you guys have ever fished, everyone who's fished here is, is too, I guarantee you. So, um, but uh, yeah, and the endless presentation options we'll go over to, which drive fishermen nuts because if you're like me, you got boxes full of stuff you'll never ever throw, but you bought it because it looked really good and 
<laughs> so, yeah, yeah, we're going to get in trouble here. So basic tools, um, I don't want to go too much into this. I did not bring a, my jigging rods. Um, I was going to grab one from out there, but I don't think they want your merchandise in here. So, um, But the people out there, the salesmen are happy to, to introduce you to these, these products. So um, basic tools, I prefer a spinning rod. Um, some guys use like a bait caster rod. You can do that for jigging, but most people use a spinning rod. Uh, just for the, the t feel and the technique and the intimacy with your equipment, um, your tool, um, and a spinning reel. So sizes we're talking about, not this size, not a seven, seven and a half foot towing rod. We're talking six three to six nine, a very manageable small pole, um, finesse type situation. Fishing is what we're dealing with here. Um, most of my rods are, are six six, so between six three six nine, medium power. Again, if you don't know what that means, talk to someone, look it up, but uh, it's, it's a balance. It's not a real soft rod like a panfish rod, and it's not a catfish, heavy rod. You know, it's right in the middle. It can handle 10, 12 pound fish just easily, but uh, the lightweight and the medium power allows you to detect bites better. That's why you do. Um, and the, and the, the action you want on it is a faster, extra fast. Again, can't go into all those details, but uh, you can look it up, talk to people. It's, it's basically how the pole loads. Fast and extra fast tips bend at the tip, keeping a strong backbone in here. Versus like a trolling rod has a nice even arching bend, uh, loading up evenly. Then the purpose of that fast tip is to be able to bite, detect those bites, or more importantly, your bottom, your substrate. It's your connection with, with the ground. Um, price ranges. I, I got to ask, kind of throw this out there. Most of my rods are $79.99 plus tax. Uh, I get them from Sportsman. They're not the fanciest. Um, $150 rod will buy you a great, a great jigging rod. You can spend $300, $400 for a G Loomis or bigger or JT snare rod or something like that. But um, there is there is a huge difference though between a $50, $50 rod, $80, $100 rod. So um, definitely, if you're looking for a nice rod, it's going to cost you some money, but it's going to be the nicest rod you own, um, and it's going to be the tool you probably use with the most. Um, you want to pair that with a smooth action spinning reel, 1500 to 2500. Uh, some manufacturers call this you know, 150, 200, whatever. Again, these are me medium-sized reels, um, not big, not little teeny ice fishing reels, so um, good balance. Uh, the more bearings, the smoother it gets, play with them, find one you like. Because uh, you're going to be, and the reason you want to spend money and take your time buying this uh, nice jigging rod is because you're going to be spending a lot of time with it in your hands. Um, you don't want a big, heavy, clunky, terrible reel because you want it to be smooth and comfortable all day long. Because um, I'm jigging eight, nine hours a day when I fish. You know, um, sometimes you troll, sometimes you do other techniques, but most of the time I'm jigging. Um, and the, and the same, good spinning reels, 80, 80 to $300 plus. Kind of ridiculous how expensive fishing has gotten, but uh, it is what it is. But, um, uh, the shallow schools that I mentioned on there, when you're jigging, you're not dealing with a lot of lines. So it can actually be a benefit to have a spool with a shallower, so you put less line on it, save you some money that way. Um, you're not making long 100 foot casts, stuff like that. So. Uh, fishing line, use whatever you want to use. I was a monofilament guy, six to eight pound test is best. I switched over to super lines a couple years ago because the non-stretch, they're the absolute most sensitive you can get. Um, takes a little time to, to, to get used to them. And uh, the biggest reason I didn't ever switch was because I hated tying those backpack uni knots. So, because you always, with, uh, with fire or super lines, braids, Sometimes there's conditions you can fish them straight to a, a jig. Most of the time you're going to put a leader on there, a fluorocarbon or a mono, just because of its visibility, you know, its uh, transparency. So uh, again, eight to ten pound test ranges are great options. Those are actually break strengths of like 20 pounds plus. So um, I never go about 10. But uh, anyways, fluorocarbon. Let's move on. Uh, terminal tackle. Here's where the endless options happen. A jig. A, a jig can be basically anything, but it's uh, it's just a mechanism to get your bait down to the bottom. It's always paired with something else. You can see these are bare 
hooks. They're going to put a, a minnow on there. In the Midwest, they use uh, a, a minnow bait, sorry, because uh, we can't use live bait in Utah. You're going to put a night crawler on there, is, is about the most <laughs> live bait you can use here. But uh, little curly tails, paddle tails, um, jerk, jerk minnows, stuff like that. But, anyways, some basic jigs, you've all seen those. There's specialty jigs for fishing in weeds. Uh, logs, you don't want to get hung up. They're stand-up jigs to keep your bait oriented up instead of falling over. And then jigging spoons. Great wintertime stuff, but they work in the summer. Um, if no one's ever jigged for trout at Deer Creek with that, that jigging spoon, you're missing out. That is some fun stuff. Uh, find fish, 45, 50 feet, drop on them, pop it a couple times, and they'll travel and nail it. But, uh, anyways, moving on, swim baits. Uh, some jigs come pre-molded, you know, a jig inside, uh, caught quite a few stripers on the Sacramento Delta with that exact one up there on the top right. Um, vibration jigs, more bass stuff that, that do work for walleyes. And then uh, Hammer was talking about finding those open water fish using jigging wraps. It's just a big piece of lead. Um, it's the weirdest thing you've ever seen, you know, you think, well, how do I catch fish with a just giant piece of lead? They work. So. Um, and then you got hybrid options, uh, the rip and wrap. Great bait to use, especially ice fishing. Uh, these are fished more vertically, because obviously a whole ice, but you can fish them open water. Um, it's a hybrid between like a crankbait and jig. It's got metal beads inside, weight that allows it to fall. But the design of those, if you actually retrieve them like a crankbait, they will wobble and move. So, nice hybrid option. Um, okay, getting close some time. Got the gear, now what do we do? Um, won't go into all the details, but you guys probably looked up the walleye waters, plus you saw um, pre presentations, you know, we got Lake Powell, we got Willard. Nowhere has water, by the way. It's all pretty empty. And Willard, I, I can attest, I watched about eight of those females come out this morning. I was out on Willard, um, getting the boat broke in, and watched those guys net. There's quite a few walleyes out there. So, uh, hopefully it's good gear, but average depth I saw was like 11, 12 feet. So it's, it's like 10 feet lower than normal is, at least. So be careful if you go out. There's a lot of, nobody thinks there's a lot of structure in Willard, but there definitely is. And you don't want to find it with your prop. Just tell me. So, um, fishing from shore. Okay, jigging. We can jig anywhere, anyhow. On a vessel, kayak, boat, or we can fish from the shore if you don't have those. Uh, fishing is great right now. Springtime, the walleyes are close to shore. And sometimes they're at your feet. You go out in full full moon. I've seen fish three feet from your, you know, from your legs. Um, so they are close, and this is the best time of the year for people to get them from the bank. Um, location is always key for walleyes. Walleyes move. A lot of people don't think walleyes move. They absolutely move. They love current. They love rivers, and they love um, chasing fish. That's what they're doing. They're chasing bait fish. So they never just sit there and hang out and idle. Um, if you've ever seen the walleyes at the Cabela's down in Lehigh, they're always hiding underneath those logs and stuff like that. It's because they're in a fish tank. They, they, they migrate, they move. They're pack, they're pack feeders, so they're there one minute and gone the next. Location is always key, just like human beings, you know what I mean? The Starbucks is super packed in the morning and then it goes down in the afternoon. Same with walleyes. Early mornings, they are on those points. Unique structures, drop-offs. They are searching for food. That's why they're there. Everything they do is for food. Just let you know, they don't recreate, they don't hang out. They, they are always by food. So if you find the food, you find the walleyes. Um, casting and jigging from shore, that's basically your most technique. And, when I'm, and we're talking jigging. I should have took a step back. Jigging is very intimate. Um, it's the, your closest connection with the fish, with the ground. We're talking 60, maybe a max 100 foot casts, okay? We're not talking long bombs. Uh, most of the time I'm pitching 40, 50 feet out to the side. Not much line, I have direct contact with the bottom. Uh, I can tell with those super lines if it's sandy bottom, if there's a little bit of gravel in there, if it's hard rock. You can tell all these things when you get used to it. But you're, when you're digging, you're, you're fairly close. The farther you cast away, the less sensitivity, the less control you have over your bait. So, why, when are we going to jig? We're going to jig when we find fish or when we find structure. Unlike bottom bouncing, great technique for finding fish. 
Or like Hammer was talking about, bombing across the lake at 48 miles an hour with the sonar until you saw a school of fish and then comes around. Once you find those fish, that's where you jig. It's, it's a waste of time just to go out to a random spot and just start pitching jigs. It really is. Because it's a finesse technique. It's, it's, it's the one, it's after you've done your diligence and found the fish, this is the technique you want to use. If you don't know where the fish are, the fish are scattered, body balancing, pulling cranks is a much better option until you find them. And if they're concentrated, your best option is to put those trolling rods away and grab your jigging rod. So, um, again, very, most versatile technique. Um, 805, okay. You can, you can work a bait as, as differently as you want to. Uh, I got little three inch hops, you can drag it along the bottom, top it, rip it, you can pull it in, you know, like a, like a crankbait. Fishing from a vessel, a bow, pontoon, kayak, paddleboard, whatever you fish from, is a much better option because you got more access to more parts of the lake, uh, your angles are better, your physics, um, you don't get hung up as much. Um, yeah, I, I skipped over the prepared to lose jigs, by the way. Jigging, you're in the rocks, you're on the bottom, you're going to lose jigs. Uh, you can be frustrated like I was for years or just accept that it's part of the process. So always buy two or three boxes instead of one. Um, but anyways, fishing from shore, yeah, you can move around and you can use your graphs to find and locate fish faster and easy. Um, and then, yeah, you can incorporate, like I said, jigging. You can do it with a drift, you can do it with a troll, you can do it with other things. So, jigging for walleyes in Utah right now is absolutely the best time for shore anglers. Um, fish are, are, are starting to spawn. Um, most of them are done um, up here in the northern section. Uh, Deer Creek and starvation have yet to start, but uh, they will be soon. Um, minnows. Walleyes, if they have a choice, they're going to find a minnow. So use minnow profiles. Summertime, again, minnows. Worms, worms look really good on a jig. Um, a lot of vertical fishing happens in the summer just because the fish move deeper, stuff like that. But uh, fall, great time to fish. Um, all the little bait fish, all the little perch, uh, shad grown big. It's time to throw, throw in you know, baits that are the same size as those fish. And then winter, fish still eat. Like I said, those walleyes eat year round. They do not go dormant, they are not bears, they do not hibernate. They are feeding, they just, and, and people say they slow down, but to be honest, I've caught more fish in 32 degree water than, than I do in, in 70 degree water, you know? So um, they want to feed, you just got to change your techniques. So, um, but yeah, again, minnows, spoons, those are the kind of invitations you want. But uh, anyways, that's, we'll ask questions later, but for now. next speaker is Michael Badger. Uh, Michael Badger does a lot of service with our club, putting together um, all the video presentations, YouTube, newsletters, emails, so we really appreciate his support. Uh, he's going to be speaking about what Rocky Mountain Angler does and what we can get out of it. So I'm not, I'm not talking techniques, I'm just going to tell you guys a little bit about Rocky Mountain Angler. So this should only take a couple minutes and then you guys can ask the guys uh, what you really came here for. Um, but just a little bit about me, a couple, couple years ago, um, had a house fire. Doesn't seem like it makes sense, but I'll explain. Um, and when I had the house fire, I had a little bit of OCD. So, so uh, I was obsessed with getting my house fixed. I'm a pretty well adjusted guy, but I started having panic attacks and my wife's like, you've got to have a hobby other than messing with the house the whole time and worrying about the construction and the insurance and all that. And so we took a little bit of money that we didn't necessarily have and, and bought, my, bought my first boat. Um, now I have a different obsession, but it's a little bit more healthy. And, and we got the boat, it was great, loved fishing, loved taking the family out. Um, and had a lot of fun boating at the beginning, but we weren't catching many fish. And took the family out. They love to at least try to catch fish, but we'd usually come back, and uh, that's about all we'd have. And as my daughter would say, fishing's fun, but catching is more funner. <laughs> and and so I, I found Rocky Mountain Anglers. I started looking up on YouTube videos. I found an old walleye seminar, which is why we started this one again. Um, DWR used to put on walleye seminars every year. Um, they're really hard to put on. And uh, now that we have this great facility Shields is letting us use, we as a club decided, you know, we're going to get back and we're going to try to 
try to do this again. COVID was really hard in our club. Guys, I'm the baby in the club. I walked in and you have all these old guys uh, who, who are salty old fishermen and who know, know how to fish for all these things. There's a lot to learn from them. And, uh, and, and I really enjoy being part of this club. The other thing that the club has given me is uh, it's given me a lot of information. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to create really good content, things like this seminar. And this is, man, you ask guys like Ben and Jake to talk about the thing they love the most and tell them they only have 10 to 15 minutes. That's, that's almost as hard as waiting for the ice to break. Um, so, so we get a lot more in depth. And right now we're focusing on specific waters. Every, every month we meet here, the second Tuesday of every month in this room, um, and we go over specific waters. Last month, Ben talked about starvation. He just won the Walleye Classic, no starvation, up and down, and gave us specifics. Showed us exactly what worked, what time of day, what depth, what speeds. Um, and if you listen really well and you ask the right questions, sometimes you can find a little bit of the secret spots too. But, but just really great content, and, and, and it changed. We started catching fish. I started learning how to do it, these techniques, techniques and, and just getting out there and trying things, but learning from these guys um, what I'm doing wrong. I was one of the guys that was, you know, trolling bottom bouncers way far back because I'm going to scare the fish, you know. So I just didn't know how to do it, and it takes time. And it's easier and faster to learn from someone else than try to just, I, I call it the hunt and cuss fishing method is what I was doing before, is I would just hunt and try. My fish finder's a little 8-bit sonar, you know, it looks like 8-bit Tetris, so it's nothing fancy. But I started catching fish just with the techniques I learned in the club. Um, and so it became a lot more fun for my kids. We were catching instead of just, instead of just fishing. And, and it became a lot more fun. Now I go, now I go up to Penguich with my family every year and everyone in the club, or everybody who gets inside the boat gets a fish. Um, we, we like trolling because I, like, I don't like having hooks in my chin. Um, and so trolling's a little bit easier with kids. Um, then I went to Pallant and caught my first walleye. Whew, that changed everything. And so this club, while we are a multi-species club, we do focus on walleye, and I learned a lot about the species and really focused last year on catching walleye. I love catching, you know, going to strawberry, I love, love catching all kinds of fish, but honed in on walleye, I want to learn how to do it. And within a year, I started catching them like crazy. And so those are some of the benefits you get from being part of the club. Um, other thing about being in a club is we as anglers matter a lot as a group, but not that much as individuals. So when we collectively tell DWR we want something to happen, we can make it happen as a group. That's the other reason to be part of a club is because we have a lot of clout in and are able to sway how things go. There's a lot of things that are happening. You know, Utah Lake, they want to put a, they want to put a, a development right in the middle of Utah Lake. And whether you feel good about that or not, as a club, if we decide how we want to position ourselves, we can influence those decisions that are made in Utah. So other than catching more fish, we do a lot of just learning from each other and having fun and going to fish. That's what we do as a club. We do a lot of talking in the winter. We do a lot more fishing in the summer. So um, guys with boats, take guys who don't have boats out in the club and show you how to do it. If you have a boat and you have electronics, you've never used it, invite someone from the club on your boat and, and let them show you how to use it, you know? That's, that's, that's game changer for me. So. Uh, there's some information, you can scan it, and, and we have all of our information on Facebook. We're trying to get it more on YouTube and stuff like that so you can see these things every month. Um, but yeah, that's that's who we are, and, and uh, if you have any questions, the name tag guys will be able to answer some questions for you. And I, I don't know if we want to have speakers up and have questions, but I know you guys want to do the raffle, so we can do that too. But I'll turn the time back over to Braden. Okay, so let's do a Q&A session, um, so we can, I believe most of the speakers are here, so let, let's get started. I'll, I'll just point to whoever has a question, and we can uh, start from there. So, yes, sir. Yeah, my question is uh, on the trolling, uh, gas kicker, electric motor, he mentioned that he preferred the electric motor, but now a lot of people are using the gas to propel you, and an electric motor to steering. You know, just what are people loving? Electric motor over the gas motor or doing both of them? What's most popular now? Uh, David Banner? Uh, or? I, I can feel that from my perspective, uh, it depends on the boat. Uh, on my boat, I've got a 36-volt uh, trolling motor, so I go electric once I'm 
control it. And I control up to decent speeds uh, you know, on that all day long and, and be okay. I do see a lot of, you know, when, when I've been at, uh, at the gorge, you see, I do see a lot of people like you're talking about having a kicker motor going for propulsion and, and just <laughs> steering using the, uh, uh, the, the front trolling motor. I don't do that very much because I'm able to fish just using the front at speeds that are great for coconuting on the gorge. But I think it depends on the boat. Uh, ben, do you have a? Let's, let's go here, guys. Oh, people, guys, don't have All right. More, more is better. <laughs> more is better. If you can afford it, get a kicker. Um, I was I was a holdout too. Just use my electric. Electric works great, especially those 36 volt. As long as the wind doesn't pick up. Now, that strawberry wind picked up, it it really sucks. Yeah, get a kicker. Um, if you can afford it, it's always the technique you're using too. Um, so if you're going two and a half, three miles an hour trolling for wipers on Willard, yeah, you want no, you want your gas because your electric will not last that long. Um, and I do use my electric all the time. I turn it down to like a three uh, and hit my gas motor going two and a half. And the advantage, um, if you have the iPilot or similar like with uh, motor guide and now Garmin's out and Lorenz and whatever. But uh, when you net it, when you hook a fish. And you don't, you're trying to mess with that, you know, kicker to try to keep your boat straight and not get turned in circles. You hit this heading lock and you don't even have to worry about it. Your boat stays on track because your electric is guiding you and your motor is pushing you. So, um, plus, secondly, a kicker motor is, is a great safe butt, you know, in case your main motor dies. If your electric's going to last so long and take you so fast that a kicker will, you know, five miles an hour is better than two and a half if your electric's <laughs> Yes, sir. You showed a picture of a website. What was the uh, lake water temperatures? What website was that? It's not, it's actually not a website. Um, that's just a, a data logger that transmits um, from Willard Bay uh, to well to our email, basically. How come we can't make that public information? Um, well, for a lot of waters, uh, U.S. Geological Survey has uh, uh, loggers in the water that are public information. If you look up U.S. water data, uh, you'll find those. But uh, basically, anybody can buy, you know, a data logger, and uh, if they have property to put it on, I imagine, or permission to put it in, and have that transmitted right to their cell phone. Um, generally, we use a, uh, a data logger that looks like a, looks like a watch battery. Uh, we'll put it in a waterproof container, tie it to something, and drop it in, and then go collect it later so we can download the data. Um, what's good about this one is, uh, is it transmits the data so we can actually follow uh, the progression through the season as it starts. Um, I don't know what's involved in making something like that publicly available. That's just something that we did as a, as a lab group so that we could get the information we need to be successful. There, I use a, this is for rivers, I'm assuming it's the same for lakes, but there's a, the Water Watch, USGS, uh, federal thing, whatever, USGS.gov, Water Watch, and you can search and pick up and find stream flows, uh, you can find temperatures, in Celsius, so you got to do a little math. Yeah, so there, there are ways to find it. Or go fishing. I mean, if you want to get good at fishing, go fishing. The guys that are catching fish spend a lot of time there. They're there every week. They know what those temperatures are. So, I mean, you can't stand back and wait for the perfect patients to show up. You try to capitalize. And if you can't go fishing that often, go hang out with guys who do. Absolutely. Some of my best days ever. I haven't caught a fish. I've been skunked. Went back to the ramp and met a guy that is a fishing machine. So he taught me so much that day, and I'm like, man, I'm like, you know, I didn't catch a fish. Um, I was on uh, the internet uh, yesterday, and there is a site that gives water temperatures for uh, Utah lakes. I don't recall what that uh, website was, but. I just looked up uh, Utah Lakes water temperature and found it. 
So um, my question is about, well, so about bottom bouncing. Um, when when a strike hits or a bite, a bite happens, um, the techniques, I, I always like lose with my height. Something hits it and it's gone. It's, it, whether or not letting it take it for a little while, I don't know. Just the, the touch there of a bite and how to react to it. I should make it talk about. Um, how fast are you going? Probably about one and a half. I, I almost never go that fast. I like slow death roots because I can go slower. Um, that's one of the things I killed at with Deer, deer Creek. So, and, and it lets you go at like 0.5. I can start at 0.5 and 0.9 is usually the fastest I go with a slow death rig. And if you're losing a lot of fish that way, a lot of times it's because your boat's pulling them along too fast or something like that. And so it, you don't realize that with your sweep and the, and the boat speed, you're losing them. I used to lose a ton of fish that way. And so if you slow it down, it's way slower than you think. Like, if, if you don't have something that tells you how fast you're going, I, at the beginning, I just I had an old trolling motor, so I just pull up like a GPS like map thing and kind of guess. So talk to the sweep. That's something that we've talked about. So the sweep, sweep. It's the walleye sweep. So you, it, it's not like a bass. Yeah, yeah not, not, not a jerky. <laughs> you see so those guys that just almost fall off the side so of the So I like to see a change in speed is what you're saying. Yeah. So, yeah, I love bottom bouncing. It's a bunch of fun. So, I mean, you got to have everything else in place, too. The right depth, your speed. But, yeah, a walleye bite, you'll just see your tip just go pop. And if you don't grab it immediately, I mean, they usually drop it or so. But the sweep they're talking about is, yeah, just a, just a steady pull forward to set those hooks. You don't want to drop the pole back because then that drops the whole rig and pulls that in and out. But, yeah. So it, it's just, just grab your pole and, and basically pick it up forward. Okay, so the sweep is not to lure the fish. I was no, not, I thought the sweep was like to that's attract the hook. Okay, it's so after you get the bite. Yeah, because because the, the hook set, it's not like bass. You're not going to jerk. You're just going to easily set the hook, or else they'll just drop. Because they have hard hands. Well, where could I, I learn uh, <laughs> the patterns for uh, smiley blades and spinners behind uh, bottom bouncers? The colors and the size of beads that you're making, you're making your own. Size five. I, uh, I have about every color under the rainbow yeah. in my kit. Um, and once we started finding the little black bugs where it was uh, effective at some times on, on Willard and on and at Deer Creek, uh, I couldn't find black beads anywhere. I went to a craft store. They're loaded with them. Uh, I also picked up some uh, like white, pearly looking uh, beads. Uh, I, I have heard it said that if you've got whatever color beads you're using, put one, uh, if it's all light color, put one dark in there because supposedly it's like a fish's pupil. So they'll, they'll see the difference of the color and that'll do something. I can't swear to that, but I usually make most of mine that way with one odd bead and, and the four or five beads that are on the floor. Where are you fishing? Uh, Deer Creek. Deer Creek. Black and gold. Gold. Black and gold. Silver and chartreuse. Black and gold. Black and gold. Silver and chartreuse. My best colors. Black and gold smile blades. A little bit of crock fish paint. So in the smile blades, I don't know if we have that. We don't have that uh, slide. But David talked about the metal blades, the Colorado blades, and then the smile blades. Smile blades. Yeah. Slow speeds. Like you said, 0 0.3, 0 0.5. They spin. At just a whip versus those metal blades, depending on the size, they take quite a bit of speed. One, 1.3, you start getting them to spin. And they fall the way too. The stoke depth are really good. They're better than good hooks. I, I always use two hooks. No, the slug depth is good. It's good for you to Soft reference. So, and, and I don't know if we talked about leader length on that too, bottom balancing. So, I mean, you'll vary it, but I never usually go more than three feet. You use floaters with smile blades? Nope, I don't use floaters at all. Um, if I'm dragging bottom, I shorten my leader. I mean, I've gone down to 12 inches. Some people are like, that's the weirdest thing. No, because my bottom bouncer is 12 inches long. So when I'm going 0.5, you know, it's not dragging on the bottom, they, they still do. Okay, we'll take one more question because we got to get to our raffle. <laughs> Your smile blades, what size? You've got 0.8, 1 point something? 1.1. And then upsize in the summertime when they get more aggressive. Okay, we'll pause the questions till after. Uh, let's go ahead and proceed with the raffle. Um, should we 
get Batman to come on up and draw? Yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody get your tickets out. What we're going to do is just yell out the number. Okay. Yeah, please, yeah, please do. Okay, we'll start with, uh, we've got some Shields gift cards. These are 20 bucks each. So if you want to pull five, five of them real quick. Shields has been awesome. I know I saw it. You guys all got hats and stuff. They've just been an amazing sponsor for our club and for the fishing community at large. So, um, and their fishing section, they just overhauled this year. It's been pretty nice. So, do you want to hand those to this? Oh, actually, you got the mic. So you yeah, you call them out in the line. There's five different Okay, first ticket 449877. <laughs> I'll just read the last four digits. 9869. 9846. 9844. I guess I guess if you just took somebody else's picture, I'd have issue with you. 9856. Okay, so uh, you want to do the Plano fishing box? All right. Got a four by rack system, 3600 series. Power so. power. Nine eight six four. There you go. Oh. Nine eight six four. Okay, we've got the Daywa Pro Classic LT twenty five hundred DXH. Nine eight seven six. Oh. One more. Nine eight eight nine. All right. Way to go. We pass that back to him. Thank you. Let's do the rod and we'll do the. Or no, yeah, let's do the side. I don't know. We're not giving him the invite. Okay. Okay, so this is for the. Play knife? Play knife. The electric play knife. These are awesome. You guys are going to catch a lot of fish. 9901. Alrighty! Okay. So, what kind of rod do we have here? This is a Pro Angler. She was Pro Angler. I actually have one. Yeah, it's a bait cast rod. It would be, yeah, I think it would make a great awesome uh, rock. Yeah, trolling or bottom bouncing rod. We've got four of us stick out of the trolling. Nine eight seven three. All right. Okay. Thank you for all coming. If, if you'd like to ask, have any questions answered, uh, my name's Braden. Uh, and uh, the great part of coming to their meetings is after you learn about all of the lures and equipment, you can go and shop and pick up that equipment. It's a great meeting. Thank you for coming.